Today we're in Ezekiel 21, and as I normally do, I usually do the entire chapter, but to be honest with you, this time I'm only going to do the first seven verses. So we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 1 through 7, and then when we gather together next time, I'll conclude the chapter. This is a chapter that I, I chose to entitle, and you'll see this in a moment, A Sigh and a Sword, because that's what you see in verses 1 through 7 of the book of Ezekiel chapter 21. Let's begin reading together at verse 1. I'll read to verse 7, and we'll get into our study. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Jerusalem, preach against the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. Say to the land of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword shall go out of its sheath against all flesh from south to north, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return any more. Sigh, therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart, and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. And it shall be when they say to you, Why are you sighing that you shall answer because of the news? When it comes, every heart will melt. All hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint. And all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord God. I'm only going to take you through these seven verses today because I, I wanted to share with you a little bit uh, from various portions of these seven verses to develop this particular message. I want you to see something here. I want you to see how it begins in verse 1 here in chapter 21. And let me develop a foundation for you. Notice it says, and the word of the Lord came to me. It's interesting, but that, that phrase, the word of the Lord, is used around 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. 60 times you read that phrase, the word of the Lord. As a matter of fact, three times in chapter 21, the phrase, the word of the Lord, is used. And so, right from the beginning, because he's using the phrase, the word of the Lord, that should awaken us to the importance of what is being communicated to the people. Just by fact, the fact that he is saying the word of the Lord, we ought to see that this message that Ezekiel is bringing to the people is something that is a communication from God. This is the word of the Lord. Now, to this day, this is where many people make the greatest mistake. They don't value a word from the Lord. They don't value the word of God. They don't value the word of God as it's revealed to us in the Bible. They don't recognize the wisdom given to us in Scripture. And as a result of that, they end up relying on their own wisdom. When you think about ancient history, one of the things that we need to remember is something about the Greeks. The Greeks were famous for relying on their own wisdom. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, Paul made it very clear. He said there, the Greeks seek after wisdom. All they're seeking all the fame that was associated to the Greeks was a seeking after wisdom, but all of their seeking ended up with them remaining lost. One of their greatest philosophers, we all know his name, Socrates, Socrates said this. He said, all of the wisdom of this world is but a tiny raft upon which we must set sail when we leave this earth. If only there was a firmer foundation upon which to sail, perhaps some divine word. Socrates, the philosopher that is revered amongst the Greeks, said that he wished he had something that was firmer than the wisdom of the world. He said, I wish that we had a divine word. Well, sadly, man already had received that divine word. But man had also rejected it. The world rejects the divine word, the word of God. But what is sadder is even people who claim to be Christians reject God's word, 
especially when it convicts them of their sin. Now, pastors have become aware of the fact that people don't value the Word of God, and that's one of the reasons why pastors no longer teach the Bible, because they want to be relevant, and they don't want to bring something to people that the people are going to be finding boring. And part of the problem is, is many have no longer a value for the Word of God. Now, in Psalm 119, 127, the psalmist said it like this. The psalmist said, I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, than fine gold. I love your commandments more than gold. Here's something for all of us. What would you rather, rather have if you could only have one of them? Would you rather have a Bible or a million dollars? Well, I believe very strongly that people would prefer the million dollars, even Christians. If you had an opportunity to receive a message from God or a message from man, what do you value the most? Well, in this church, we value text messages. <laughs> I just got an email from somebody saying, could you please ask the people to stop text messaging during church services? So I am. Can you please stop text messaging and receiving during church services? That's ridiculous to have to say that. But there are numbers of you who do that during services. You would rather have a text message from your friend, your dopey friend, than from God. And so when the psalmist says, I value God's word more than fine gold, he's telling us that there's something of value and what is of value is God's Word. Now, some people would say, well, I'd like a message from God as well as some money. And that's the reason they go to the churches that promise both. And what ends up is you get ripped off. You know, one of the things that you will discover, if you haven't already, is there are some things that money just can't buy. You know, there were four, uh, four prophets who said that, can't buy me love. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> and that's a fact. You can't buy love. You know that. At least you ought to by now. There are some things that money can't buy. Money can't buy peace. Money can't buy joy. You see, for most, faith in God and trust in His Word is something that really depends on their circumstances. If, if they're doing well, then everything is fine. They don't even think of God. When they're not doing well, that's when they think of God the most. And when things turn around and they're doing well again, then once again, they no longer think of God. They don't think of His Word. They don't think of prayer meetings. They don't think of Bible studies. They don't think of church service. They don't think of any of those things. Some of you have heard of Regina Spector. She's a young lady who's bringing out some interesting music. And, and my son said, Dad, I think that you'd like the lyrics of this particular song by Regina Spector. Some of you know that song. It's called Laughing With. And um, she's in no way a, a Christian woman to my knowledge. But I think she says something that is valuable. And, and so I decided just to take her lyrics and just to read them to you because it's really to emphasize the point of, is God's word important to us? What is the most important thing? When Ezekiel is saying, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, is that important or is it not? And I think that the word of God is important. And Regina Spector said something in this, this song called Laughing With that I think makes some sense to me. And this is what she said. She sings this. I'll, I'll just read it to you. No one laughs at God in a hospital. No one laughs at God in a war. No one's laughing at God when they're starving or freezing or so very poor. No one laughs at God when the doctor calls after some routine tests. No one's laughing at God when it's gotten real late and their kid's not back from that party yet. No one laughs at God when their airplane starts to uncontrollably shake. No one's laughing at God when they see the one they love hand in hand with someone else and they hope they're mistaken. No one laughs at God when the cops knock on their door and say, we've got some bad news, sir. No one's laughing at God when there's a famine, fire, or flood. 
But God can be funny at a cocktail party while listening to a good God-themed joke. Or when the crazies say he hates us and they get so red in the head you think they're about to choke. God can be funny when told he'll give you money if you just pray the right way. And when presented like a genie who does magic like Houdini or grants wishes like Jiminy Cricket or Santa Claus, God can be hilarious. No one laughs at God in a hospital. No one laughs at God in a war. No one's laughing at God when they've lost all they've got and they don't know what for. No one laughs at God on the day they realize that the last sight they'll ever see is a pair of hateful eyes. No one's laughing at God when they're saying their goodbyes. That's true. Absolutely true. We laugh at God when, when times are okay. We laugh at God in this society, don't we? We make good God-themed jokes. Our, our late-night comedians make millions of dollars making fun of religious people. You know, we are those Bible-toting, gun-loving idiots. People make fun of us. In reality, they're making fun of the God who loves us. But you know, as a minister, as a minister of the gospel, I, I get touched by those words in a way that maybe not everybody does because that's the life I live. Because, because I'm the one that people speak to when they had those police officers at night come in saying, we have some bad news. They come to church on that Sunday and they talk to me about what happened the night before. And, and when their kid hasn't arrived home from that party and they're worried sick, as I have been when my kids haven't gotten home on time, I understand that. They're not laughing at God at that moment, are they? No, of course not. They're praying. They're asking for help. When they lose everything that they've had and they begin to cry out. And so a word from God, is it important you know, we have Bibles. We have Bibles of every size, every shape, every translation, bindings that fill shelves and, and sit on coffee tables. It's the bestseller that's least read in the United States. And, and because so many people have Bibles, many of us have more than one, perhaps we've lost sight of how valuable the Word of God really is. As we've been studying 1 Samuel, remember in chapter 3, verse 1, how it says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. The word of the Lord was rare, but the word of the Lord isn't rare anymore. We have a trustworthy word that's been given to us. It's the word of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We have a trustworthy word originating with God, and God gave us that word. And when Peter was writing, he said, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so what we have here, what we have in our hands, what we have on our laps is the very Word of God. And, and the Bible tells us it's trustworthy. In Psalm 119, uh, verse 160, it says, the entirety of your word is truth. This Bible, this Bible that we take for granted sometimes, this Bible that we're holding right now was 1,500 years in the making. The Old Testament was written between 1,400 and 400 B.C. The New Testament was written around 40 to A.D. 90. There were over 40 human authors coming from a variety of backgrounds and occupations. Moses was an exile from Egypt. David and Solomon were kings. Amos was a farmer. Daniel was a prime minister. Peter and John were fishermen. Luke was a doctor. Paul was a theologian, coming from different backgrounds, and yet God moved them all to write his word. Books of the Bible were composed on three different continents. Moses wrote when the, the Pentateuch when he was in the continent of Africa. We know that, that Ezekiel is in Asia here as he's in Babylon, and, and, and Paul wrote the prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon when he was in, in prison in Europe, in, in Rome. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It's the only book that has a prophetic word to man because 
God is the author and God knows the future. It, it's a book that covers various subjects. It, it speaks concerning the existence and nature of God, the meaning of man, the purpose of life, the final destiny of man and the world. It especially speaks to us concerning our Messiah, Jesus. Though it was written over 15 centuries in three languages with over 40 authors on three continents, we consider it to be the one book. It's one book. Though it's got 66 separate, it is called Bible, Biblos, which is simply the word book. And that's what we have. This, this one book that we have in our hand is really 66 separate books that consist of one whole message. This is the book that has influenced the United States more than any other book that has ever been written. And yet, this is the book that has been most criticized. There was a man by the name of Voltaire. He was an author, a philosopher. He was an atheist. He, he lived from 1694 to 1778. And, and Voltaire is highly influential, even to this day, amongst especially progressives and atheists. And Voltaire once wrote of Jesus Christ, curse the wretch. And he stated, every sensible man, every honorable man, must hold the Christian sect in horror. Christianity is the most ridiculous, the most absurd and bloody religion that has ever infected the world. Voltaire said, in 20 years, Christianity will be no more. My single hand shall destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. When he was dying, he was attended by his physician, Trochim, and his words were spoken and recorded by his physician. The words were spoken by Voltaire and recorded by his physician, and Voltaire said this. This is his last words. He said, I am abandoned by God and man. I will give you half of what I am worth if you will give me six months' life. Then I shall go to hell, and you will go with me. His last words, O oh Christ, O oh Jesus Christ. Voltaire. Some years later, Voltaire's house was used by the Geneva Bible Society to print Bibles. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6 says, Why do the nations rage? The people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill in Zion. The word of the Lord. This is the word that we have. This is the word that Ezekiel has been given to speak to these people, and this is what he's bringing to them. And notice what he's saying here. Three times in this chapter... He uses the phrase, the word of the Lord. In chapter 21, he says it in verse 1. He says it again in verse 8. And then finally, he says it in verse 18, the word of the Lord. And so he speaks. And as he's speaking here, he's speaking concerning this. And what he's doing is he's bringing a word from the Lord. But sadly, it is a word of judgment, a judgment that is coming. He's exiled in Babylon. But it's a word of judgment on the nation of Israel. And what he's doing is he's preaching. He's preaching against Jerusalem, the holy places, and the entire land. Now, this is the first time in the book that God specifically mentions that he's going to judge Jerusalem. And he's speaking of the invasion of Babylon that takes place in 588 B.C. Remember in chapter 20, verses 46 and 47, how that, that we, we read, Son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south and prophesy against the, the forest land, the south. And, and say to the forests of the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in you, and it shall devour every, tr every green tree and every dry tree in you. The blazing flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be scorched by it. He was speaking of southern Israel. And so that would have included all the nation. He was, he was commanded to preach and prophesy against the south. And he's saying judgment is going to hit the city, the temple, including the courts and the holy place and the holiest of all. It's going to, it's going to hit everything, including the entire nation. And, and notice what he says in verse 3. He says, Say to the land of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. 
Now, when he says that he's going to draw out his sword, the sword of the Lord is usually a picture of God's judgment. You see it in various books, but Jeremiah gives it to us in chapter 12, verse 12. It says, The plunderers have come on all the desolate heights in the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. And so it speaks of judgment. Judgment is coming. And notice in verse 4, he says, I'm going to cut off righteous and wicked from you. As the army is going to invade, people in its path are going to die. The unrighteous and the righteous together are going to die. God had speaking, spoken about in verse 20, uh, uh, chapter 20, verse 47, he had spoken of a very dry and green, green tree being consumed. It's a similar picture. He's saying, I'm bringing judgment. But I want you to see something here. Notice how he says in verse 5, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return any more. God is going to bring judgment. I have drawn out my sword, and I'm going to use the king of Babylon to bring this judgment. We'll see that next time because it's found in verse 19 of this chapter when he said, Son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon. So he's saying that, that Babylon is going to bring judgment. God is going to use the king of Babylon to bring judgment on the nation of Israel. Now, as he says that, I want you to see this with me. Ezekiel, this is what you're to do. Verse 6, sigh therefore, son of man, with a breaking heart. Sigh with bitterness before their eyes. And it shall be when they say to you, why are you sighing that you shall answer because of the news? When it comes, every heart will melt. All hands will be feeble. Every spirit will faint. All knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord God. Here we go. This is what the Lord, another one of the things that the Lord laid on my heart, reason why I didn't want to go through all of the verses. I want to spend time looking at this with you. How does God feel about bringing judgment? How does he feel about the fact that judgment is coming? Is God some great tyrant longing to destroy? You know, there are, there are believers who are longing for judgment to come, longing for it, for judgment to come. When we had our men's conference in June, there was somebody who parked his van outside in front of the church and was yelling at all the men as they were coming in, and he was holding up a sign, and he was basically telling us that we're all hypocrites, that he was the only righteous man around. Because you guys are all weak. Not one of you is man enough to speak the truth. For many years when I've been speaking at the Anaheim Men's Conference, there's been somebody who's come with his little placard and he, and he yells at and he preaches at, at the people standing in line, the men waiting to get into the Anaheim Convention Center for the men's conference. And, and he stands there and he yells at us. And he tells us all that we're a bunch of hypocrites because he, of course, is the only righteous man on the face of the earth. When you go to the summer harvest with Pastor Greg Laurie, there are always people picketing out there saying that he's a false prophet and he's not a true teacher. They do nothing other than picket the church. And there's an angry feeling that they have, a, a, almost a hatred in, it, in, 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 in the way that they speak. It, it's almost as if they, they, they want the judgment to come. I've seen the placards, and perhaps so have you, where people have had those signs that says, God hates fags. You know, uh, the, where it says gay, got AIDS yet? Where's the sympathy? Where's the compassion? Where's the love? Where's the kindness? Where's the mercy of the Lord? And you know, what kind of heart are we supposed to have when we, when we speak concerning judgment? Is God happy that he's going to destroy? That's the question. Because some people apparently think that God is so mad that he's going to just really be happy when he wipes out the earth. Is he a tyrant? Is he longing to destroy? You see, all you need to do is go to the very beginning, get into Genesis and look at Adam and look at what took place there when, when he took of that, that forbidden fruit. He did eat, his eyes were open. He knew the difference between good and evil by experience. He sows some fig leaves and he hides behind them and the voice of the Lord God calls to him in the garden. I've said this to you before, but when you read that passage and, and you see God calling out to Adam, it says, Adam, where are you? And I've told you that there are some who believe that that, that, 
voice of God must have been like the, the voice of an angry father, an angry man, an angry arresting officer, somebody who was so angry that they were just seeking for him so they might just knock him out. But the fact is, is, is what, what the actual language is saying there is it gives you the sense of an intonation of a broken heart. What it was when God was crying out to Adam was not an angry arresting father. It was the voice of a broken hearted father. Adam, where are you? had a tear to it because Adam had succumbed to temptation, yielded to it, and as a result was lost. How does God feel about the sinner? His heart breaks. All you need to do is look at Jesus. How did Jesus act when he spoke of judgment that was going to come on Jerusalem? Well, all you need to do is look at, look at Luke 13, 34. It says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. I wanted to protect you like, a, like when the hawk is going to swoop down and take the chicks and, and that, that mother chicken will actually gather her little chicks under her wings and will yield her life up before she yields up the life of her babies. That's how I feel about you. I wanted to gather you and care for you. Judgment is coming. You wouldn't listen to me. That's how God feels. In Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, it says, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. How does he feel? All you need to do is look at Jesus when he speaks of the judgment of Jerusalem. You see, Ezekiel is revealing the heart of God as he visually sighs. He's one who has a broken heart. It's not a superficial outward show only. It's something that Ezekiel is to personally feel. A devastation of a nation isn't taken lightly because sin and judgment are not small things. You see, if, if you're going to be used to give his word to those in danger of judgment, one of the necessary ingredients is compassion. The reality of eternal judgment should move us to concern and grief, not just anger because of how the world is. There are a lot of people who are angry at the conditions of the world. I'm sick of this world. I'm sick of what's going on. Well, I hate what's going on too. But that's not to move me to be angry at sinners. Isn't it Jesus who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's our responsibility to love these people, to care for them. You see, some people think that hell is a joke or it doesn't exist or it's a place where you're going to party for eternity. But we know it's not a place of party, and we know it's a place of agony, and that's why we preach with the passion that we do. Jesus, in, in Mark chapter 9, verses 43 and 44, speaking of hell, said, It's a place where the fire shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die, and the fire, he said, is not quenched. In, in Hebrews 10, 31, it says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so Ezekiel is saying that this judgment causes a heartbroken sorrow. And, and as he's giving message, as he's giving this message, he's, he's to have a broken heart. And, and he's to have a grief that, that does not go unnoticed. I, I believe that on occasion, revealing sincere concern actually enhances a sense of conviction. When, when, when you're sharing with somebody and and a sincere tear can fall from your eyes because you are that concerned for them. Sometimes the Lord can use that. Sometimes the Lord can use that. It's part of the conviction process. It's part of awakening them to the sincerity of your heart and the reality of the message. And, and God sometimes can use that. 
It's not just some cold and calculated message that we just kind of give without a sense of passion. You, you share sometimes with a broken heart. You, you share sometimes with, with, with a sense that, 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 that I want to get through to these people. I, 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 I want these people to hear what's being said. There have been many times in my own ministry, and I can say this before the Lord with all sincerity, that, that I realize that the words that I'm speaking at that time have fallen on deaf ears. People don't really care. I'm quite serious when I say they care more about the texts than they do about the Word of God. I'm quite serious about that because that's absolutely true. It's absolutely, absolutely true. They care more about other things than the things of God. I've shared this with you before. I was teaching a home Bible study many years ago, and, and during the study, there were some, uh, a couple of young girls who were seated off to my left, and they were as bored as they can get. You know, one good thing about young people is they let you know with their face exactly what they're feeling. And they were letting me know that they were ready for me to stop talking the minute I opened my mouth. And they had that look for the next 40 minutes. And I, as I was teaching, and I would look in their direction, and they just had that, oh, look to them. I found it amazing when I concluded the study that they were in the kitchen area, and they were animated. I mean, they were, they were talking, and they were just with a big smile on their face. And what a contrast it was to a moment before as they were in the Bible study. I have to be honest. I, I thought, now, what is it that is making them so excited that they're laughing and smiling as they speak about it? So I walked up next to them, and listened in. And you know what they were talking about? Their boyfriends. They were so excited about their boyfriends that it put a smile on their face and a giggle in their mouth. The Word of God? No. I mean, that's just something boring I have to come and listen to because my mom made me come tonight. But what really is important to me is that little snotty-nosed boy that I'm in love with. <laughs> that's what's really important to me. And you know what? It doesn't have to be something that simple. It's, it, it, it could be anything. I mean, all you need to do is go back to the original thing when I said, what would you rather have, a million dollars or the Word of God? What would you really, really, really rather have? And that helps you to set your priorities right in order. If there's only one thing you could have, God's Word or a million dollars, what do you really want? Well, the average person would honestly say, you know, I'd just as soon have I have a million dollars and I'll borrow somebody's Bible. <laughs> I'll read over your shoulder. But if there was only one thing that you could have, because you know what? I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. And it's the Word of God that brings comfort. It's the Word of God that brings peace. It's the Word of God that gives me stability. It's the Word of God that gives me hope. It's the Word of God that gives me guidance. It's the Word of God that gives me freedom. It's the Word of God that gives me faith. There is so much in the Word of God that money cannot buy. You can't have it. When, you're, when you're, your kid isn't doing well, what good is all the money in the world when that person, that kid whom you love with all of your heart is not doing well? When, you, when you're... Your loved one is there in the hospital. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. There's no hope for that person. You could, you could have a billion dollars. There's just no hope. And what, what's going to happen to you? And what's going to happen to them? And where's your peace and your comfort going to come from at that moment? It isn't going to come from your bank account. It doesn't come from there. It comes from a faith in God and a trust in His promises and the reality of, of God who has stated to us, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's what drags me through this world right now. That's what keeps me going. It's not the money. It's not the car. It's not the house. It's the Lord. It's the Word of God. And that's what gives you strength. That's what you need is the Word of God and God moving in your life. And so, when Ezekiel is given this word, he says, judgment is coming, Ezekiel. Sigh before them with a broken heart so they know my heart towards them because I don't want to destroy them. I don't want to judge them. But I am. They've rejected me. 
They love their idols. They're sacrificing their children. And they sit before you as if they're my people, but they're not my people. They hear, but they don't do, Ezekiel. So go before them and show them my heart. Sigh as one who has a broken heart, one who is in grief. If you want to be used by the Lord, learn to love and weep for those who are lost. The Bible says, He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's how you're going to be used. When you actually care enough about somebody to cry over them because they don't know Jesus and they're miserable and they're lost. They don't know him. Don't take your faith for granted. Don't take Jesus for granted. Love him. Now, a second aspect of this is going to be their response to what's going to happen. God's heart is broken because he's bringing judgment. Theirs is broken because they're going to experience it. And dismay will overwhelm them as they hear the message in anticipation of what is soon to happen to them. And God says in verse 7, it's coming. It shall be brought to pass. On this you can be certain, this will happen. The message is sure, but will they respond to it? It's interesting how in Luke chapter 17, Jesus said this in verses 26 through 30. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Do people care about the Word of God? The average person doesn't. The message of the church has been going forth. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. People don't care. They say, since the father went, fathers went to sleep, you've been saying Jesus is returning, and he hasn't. He's just one day closer. He's one day closer, but he is returning. How did they respond in the days of Noah? How did they respond in the days of Lot? They continued life as if it was going to remain the same and never change. But judgment did come. Judgment did catch them, and they weren't prepared and they were caught in it. We, the church, have been warned so that we are not as those who sleep. We're aware, but we have to live sober lives, awaiting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and working until he does return. May our hearts and our priorities be right. And for those who have been putting off a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. It's not something to be put off. It's something to experience now. Because God can forgive every sin, and God can make you brand new, and God will wash you and cleanse you, and God will forgive you, and God will give you that peace, and God will give you that joy, and God will give you that love, because that comes through him when you yield yourself to him, and you confess and for ask for forgiveness and say, God, I have sinned against you. Forgive me, a sinner. Come into my life.